great pleasure to have um, Raphael Ferrer here. So Raphael is a professor of statistics. Statistics, yeah. Professor of statistics at uh, Foundry Care. And uh, we have been working on a number of sort of projects as part of DRC, we are part of the same team uh, over the past few years. And today I was just asking him what he's gonna tell us about and he says a lot of interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'll be very interesting. <laughs> about disease and disease monitoring. Uh, which I think his work is very relevant to many of the projects that uh, we have been doing and thinking about, um, not only in terms of the methodology, but also in the context of um, chronic disease in general and um, trajectories of people with chronic disease over time. Um, so really looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me to be here. I'm going to be, in a way, presenting a series of slides that uh, are just snippets of the type of work that we've been doing over the last 10 years or so, um, since a bit longer than that, since 2007. And I'm, I'm happy to say that just looking at your annual report, I don't have any statistics that are uh, discordant with what you put out. <laughs> so I'm very pleased about that. My uh, work that we, we've been doing is mainly around trying to understand how we manage long-term conditions and either long-term or non-communicable diseases are in many ways used as synonyms we are looking at diseases of long duration and generally slow progression. The four general types are cardiovascular disease, cancer, respiratory diseases, and diabetes, which in a way are, is probably your bread and butter, and it, it's become in some cases my bread and butter, but from a perspective of a clinical management rather than um, prevention and population health, which is I think what you've been focusing on. And I think these are the statistics that I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, around 70%, more than 70% of all deaths are attributable to this type of conditions. And particularly in low and middle income countries, the majority of premature deaths are based around what happened because of um, non-communicable diseases. We, I've already mentioned roughly what are these, and the majority of them are around cardiovascular, about one half of, the, of these are cardiovascular diseases, and about 25%, one, qu one quarter are about cancers. And both in terms of population prevention in, in population health, but also in clinical management, the key aspects of our detection, screening, and treatment. And there's an element, obviously, of palliative care when we decided or we identified that the condition is too far down the trajectory. But a key aspect of in, in all of these cases is understanding that there might be a test that we might use, or a series of tests that we might use in terms of for detection or for screening, or also to identify if the treatment that we're carrying out is actually being effective or not, or we need to change that treatment. And this is just a slide showing the classic example of someone that has a chronic condition, let's say diabetes, and is using some form of device, in this case a blood glucose um, monitor, to find out if he is basically being uh, well managed. And it's been told that he's being well managed because he has taken a series of measurements. And in a way, this is hinting, this, this um, graph, what it's showing you is that although this person might be on average completely sort of well looked after in control, there's gonna be a quite a lot of variability in the measurements and that can change pretty much day to day or in week to week or hour to hour. And some of that variability is what is important from my perspective, obviously, as a statistician, because it will affect or will impact on the clinical decisions that we make. The particular threshold might have a significant impact as, as to what we do. And deciding which thing to measure or which, which things to, to track is going to be, in many cases, uh, critical. So for some conditions, like in the case of diabetes, we think we know already what we're going to be measuring. HbA1c is probably the thing that we're <coughs> most likely to use. But for other things, it's, there's some debate about which one is the method that we should be using. And that's one aspect of the type of general framework that I'm going to be talking to you about. I love this slide because in a way it highlights how the tests are used at different stages of a condition. We can think of different phases. Phase one, when someone is identified as having potentially a, a condition, let's say in this case is um, hypertension, high blood pressure. So in phase one, there's an initial measurement and there might be a remeasure closely followed after that in order to detect if the initial measurement is actually real or not. And you might then decide, yes, it is real. We give you a label of having, having hypertension. Then second phase, you have maybe 
less frequent measurements, but still a series of measurements. When treatment, treatment comes in, and what we want to find out is whether treatment is actually effective or not. So the measurements in that case is, is to check if the treatment is actually having the desired effect. In this case, bringing in the blood pressure down to maybe a, a, an area uh, that we would call within control. And when we get to that level of control, then we might space out the measurements because we think, okay, the person is in control, the treatment is actually working, and we only want to find out in the long term if that is actually having the same effect. And we might identify that it's not having an effect, and we might need to change the treatment at that particular pace, maybe increase the, the titration of the medication that's being used in order to bring them back into the right sort of level. So control phases, and then it might be that we get a final phase when we get the individuals actually well managed. We know, for example, in type 2 diabetes, some people actually come back to being normal um, after a, a particular type of treatment, particular, particular type of interventions. And if that happens, well, we might stop measuring or measuring in less, less frequent ways. But people, is this sort of, it might not be familiar to everyone, but is, is it more or less um, understandable? But now, depending on where we are in each one of these phases, which I was talking about, um, the objectives of measuring vary. In, I mentioned already in the first phase, the main focus is we need to find out if there is a need for treatment and then establish if there's um, what would be the particular baseline in this case of hypertension and where we want to, where we want to reduce that level to. And the optimal interval for the measurements might be short because we want to find out very quickly if there is a need for a particular intervention or not. And that's very different to the initial titration where we already have identified the individual needs to have a treatment and what we want to work out then is if the treatment is effective or not and achieve control. Then we get the maintenance, as I was telling you about. Um, there might be a different control limits depending on where we are initially or where we, I'll, t I'll touch a little bit more about the control limits in a, in a minute, giving you an example. And the focus there is about detecting long-term changes and potentially long-term harms as well. So we want to still carry on having these measurements. And then finally, we might have uh, to establish control if there's out of place and cessation if we have identified a situation where the treatment is no longer necessary. Now, we can think of monitoring as a way of, a, in a way, a, as a complex intervention. So what we have is measure something, we get information out of that particular measurement, and there's going to be a change in something that we do in terms of the treatment. It might be, for example, changing the drug that we're using, or change in um, the uh, information that we're going to be providing to the individual, maybe tasking them to do more exercise or change their diet. So if we think of it as an intervention, we can imagine that the best approach would be a randomized control trial that provide us with an, an unbiased evaluation of whether the monitoring regime compared to, let's say, usual care is going to be effective or not. And we would have, in, just like in the case of, let's say, a diagnostic test, we have monitoring or a diagnostic test, identify those that have, in the case of monitoring, disease progression, which would change their treatment, Again, we modify them, and then find out how many of those will actually improve compared to the usual care where in the usual care what we have is um, because we don't monitor, we do not change, we do not treat anyone. And that would be the basis of actually seeing a difference between the two groups, the ones in the usual care and the monitoring regime. Unfortunately, in many situations, and this is also apparent in diagnostic tests in general, very often it's going to be very difficult to actually set up a randomized control trial that would define the right or would do the right comparisons. Um, why is this? As I was saying, it could be that we don't know exactly which tests we're going to be using. There might be problems with that. It might be that uh, we don't know who should be doing the measurement. There might be uncertainty regarding that. It might be, there might be uncertainty also regarding the um, optimal frequency of the measurements themselves. How soon should we, should we be measuring? Uh, because we might not know enough about the variability of the measure itself. And finally, we might not know even uh, what to do with the measurements themselves. The thresholds for which might activate a change in the decision might also be um, unknown. In, because of all those unknowns, it might be better, instead of using a randomized controlled trial, which might not be feasible or possible, to instead adopt a modeling approach. 
And that's what the focus of my, my talk is going to be about. What we do in terms of, if we want to set up a modeling approach for monitoring, there's going to be a lot of information that we need to collect. And I find this general framework quite useful in order to understand the bits of information, the gaps in the knowledge that we need to fill in in order to create a, it could be an economic model, it could be a statistical model, in order to define what um, monitoring strategies we're likely to use for a particular condition. We need to know the information on the condition and treatment. What is it? What's the natural progression? We need to know about the test itself. We need to know about the impact of the monitoring regime of the test themselves, how, how it affects the individual, and whether if we implement this monitoring, how it will actually affect um, both the health practitioners and the patients themselves. Let's focus on the first one. We look at information condition on treatment. The things that we want to find out about is, um, are about the natural history and the nature of the condition and whether there are treatments available for that particular condition. In the case, again, of diabetes, we might already say, well, what is a natural history? Typically, if you have type 2 diabetes, it will remain with you for the rest of your life. Very few people actually uh, recover as such, and it is a gradual, usually long-term progression or deterioration until um, um, the end, until you die. But there are treatments available. For example, again, in the case of diabetes, the fir first-line treatment would be metformin, let's say. What have we done to understand or develop evidence around this, um, these issues? Well, we can do cohort studies. We can understand what's happening to a particular population of, of individuals. We can do systematic reviews. We have done systematic reviews around, again, the natural history of the condition. Systematic reviews around the treatments as well. That's also very popular. In fact, you guys have done quite a lot of systematic reviews on um, treating people with blood pressure. Uh, we can do secondary analysis of observational cohorts and randomized controlled trials, and as part of that, obviously, analysis of electronic health records. Let me give you a couple of examples of the type of work, of the work that we've been doing. One area that we've been in working on, and this is um, one general area that I'll, many of my examples will focus on, is uh, around chronic kidney disease. So, chronic kidney disease is a little bit contentious, in the sense that um, it's relatively novel. Um, the idea is that you can identify earlier on whether someone's kidney has deteriorated to a certain level and whether that deterioration is going to carry on to the point that you, they have end stage renal disease to the point of transplantation. So the focus of, generally the focus of, initial focus of chronic kidney disease, not the general, but the initial focus of chronic kidney disease was to detect early individuals that were going to end up with end stage renal disease. That has switched and now generally the use of um, the different stages of chronic kidney disease, early stages which would be 1 and 2, middle stages 3A, 3B and then later stages 4 and 5 are mainly because there's a strong association between these stages and your increased risk of cardiovascular disease or having a cardiovascular uh, problem. So in this particular example we were interested in finding out what is the natural history of these individuals? People that have, are seen in general practice are usually in the first stages of their um, chronic kidney disease, defined by having an uh, estimated GFR, which is, if not all of you know, maybe many of you know, is basically a measure of how well your kidney is working. If your uh, GF, eGFR is around 100%, is working very well, below 90% is deemed there's some kind of impairment. Uh, below 60% is a significant impairment. Below 40, I think, the different thresholds, it is, it is major. And um, you're probably not surprised to know that the there's a strong association between your eGFR level and age. More to that in a, in a minute. So in this case, we're interested in individuals that have mild impaired um, renal function. So eGFR is slightly below 90, which is typical to what you see in the primary care population. That's why our focus is on that. Identifying in a certain way and then find out if there is a substantial change in a period of time. And that period of time was defined based around um, a baseline and then six months later. And just to highlight here that our definition of baseline, uh, 
because we know there's quite a lot of variation in the EGFR, we had to use three measures. So we identified or got measurements at weeks zero to, sorry about the, uh, zero, two, and 12, and use that to define what a baseline level happened to be, and then work out a follow-up. Ideally, it was after 24 months from that initial visit. One thing, remember that I was telling you about, sometimes we don't know which marker is the best. One of the main things, that, well, actually the main thing that we wanted to work out in this particular study was which type of biomarker was the best to follow people up. There's the one that we commonly use, which is serum creatinine, and one that has been um, approved by NICE recently, I think, well, not that recent, maybe four or five years ago. I think it was five years ago, although it hasn't been actually widely adopted everywhere, which is cystatin C. And one of the things that we wanted to find out whether it actually made a substantial difference which one we use in order to track people up. And for those of you that know your C statistics, you can see that both of them are absolutely useless. So it's equivalent to flipping a coin. Useless for what? Predicting, Predicting change. Predicting change, not a long trajectory. Correct. What models we use for detecting change? Yes. Uh, this is this is literally just looking at the initial um, value. We looked at serum creatinine at baseline compared to serum creatinine change, and we, in terms of just simple linear regression and work out that the C statistic was 0.5 without, without taking anything else into consideration. And the idea, we actually expected it to be significant that higher levels of uh, serum, because we know that as the disease progresses, the deterioration increases. So the, the focus was, well, we might be able to identify through one of these biomarkers if the higher levels actually are associated with um, faster deterioration or faster changes, and apparently we can't, at least not with this population. There are obviously issues regarding... Would have been different if you would have looked at projection using some sort of a, uh, you know, GLM model and which had been the trend over the past last three weeks and then looked at the, you know, the, the trajectories over time instead of a simple regression or change. It could be, it could be. I, I You're losing information here, right? You just... It could be. I'll, uh, I'll, before we, I think we have a paper draft of this, so uh, I'll, 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 I'll check what we're doing and then pick your brains and see if, if we can do something better. We had a lot of trouble um, uh, convincing the NIHR who was funded this as to which measurements we're going to be using. Because the classic approach with this type of things is to have, for example, a bland outlump approach where you're looking at um, whether there's good agreement between the different tests. But the problem here is that you're actually not necessarily looking at the same test. So you have the baseline with one measurement and then the follow-up with a same measurement and you have to do the analysis with, it, with separate measurements at the same time. So it, is, it was a little bit challenging. But this is one type of project that we, we work on. Another type of approach, again, in the area of chronic kidney disease, just thinking about what's happening uh, in the management of this particular condition over time. Uh, in this case, we use uh, CPRD, the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, so electronic health records uh, from 93 to 2013, the last 20 years. And the focus here is to try to understand how the number of tests being requested by the labs has changed over time. And if we could actually identify if significant things like, for example, the publication of uh, the Kidoki guidance um, uh, or the publication of um, the um, Quality Outcomes Framework, QOF, had a significant effect on the number of tests. And we see um, some of that. So there's been uh, some, some of those um, interventions, let's call them, having an impact particularly around primary care so that's the blue line. Sorry, that is the black line over here. See a, a, a significant change over time, but not, not really. Sorry, actually, it was in secondary care where we see some of, some of the effect of these things. So there doesn't seem to be a particular 
link between the type of interventions, the arrival of different guidance, and then a change uh, on the number of tests that we've been observed. But what we have observed is um, that we can also quantify, for example, the number of tests and the type of tests or the type of population for which the tests have been used over that period of time. And what we're seeing here is that there is, there's been a significant change in the number of tests. So if we look, for example, in, um, let's, let's pick a number, to, to, in 2000, this, the, the number of tests was um, around 50,000. By the time we reached 2013, so, or 2010, let's say, we have 200,000 um, uh, tests being requested within, uh, in, in terms of um, creatinine levels and for, for calculation of EGFR. And the majority of those tests are, as we believe, in individuals that do not have kidney or really um, late stages of kidney disease. The majority of them are in the early stages, either normal levels above, EGFRs above 90, the majority of those uh, in, 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 uh, increases happen in that group, or in the 60 to 89, which will be um, so fairly early stages of TKD. I mentioned as well that one of the things that we want to work out are the impact, if there's an impact of treatment in the um, natural history of the condition. Why do we want to know that? Because if there is no substantial thing that we can do to the, to the condition, then it doesn't matter if we measure it. Um, there's nothing we can do about it, just measure it again. And that was something that we, again, grappled with in the case of chronic kidney disease. When we talked to the different experts, the nephrologists around chronic kidney disease, and we asked them, well, what, what do we do when, once we identify someone is really in three, 3A or stage two, which is fairly early on. What, and we already, and, uh, so let's say, what do we know if we, have, we know someone is in 3A? Well, you give them a um, statin. Well, what happens if we know they're already on statin? Well, we measure them again. And what happens if, again, go into 3B and they're on statin? Well, nothing, you, keep, you just follow them up. It appears that there's no real change that would occur to individuals in this particular condition um, due to the measurement themselves. So the focus of monitoring them for chronic kidney disease was just to carry on monitoring, which is not the case for many other conditions. What I'm saying, trying to say is it is important to know that the measurement itself would actually lead to a potential change in the clinical management. And what we did here is to try to find out, in the, again, in the case of chronic kidney disease, if there are some medications that would help in the reduction or the increase in this case of EGFR, of EGFR, that is on increasing their renal capacity, the renal function. And what we found is there's a, there's a marginal association in the case of lipid-modifying drugs. Um, so statins and the like appears to um, have a partial improvement in the, the EGFR. Um, it's, it's not very, very large. And similarly for um, glycemic control drugs. In this case, we only have it for diabetics. That's the, only, that's the only group that actually provided information for because they're the only ones that, for which trials were, were carried out. So in this case, we were doing um, what probably bread and butter for you, a systematic review of all these different trials and trying to uh, work out the important effect found um, after treatment. So far so good? So that's a, the basic background information, knowing the condition and the potential treatments that we're going to be getting. The next stage is we want to work out the, um, we need to know about the tests themselves. How are they going to be potentially useful? We need to know a little bit more about the nature of the test, whether it's a direct measure or a surrogate. I already mentioned a little bit about this when I talk about the use of creatinine or cystatin C. We need to know a little, well, the differences of which one we're going to be using. We need to define if it is going to be useful in the sense that it responds rapidly to potential changes in the condition. So if we give someone a treatment, can we detect that change in the condition through the measures that we're using or not? Um, for example, going back to diabetes, 
the fact um, uh, glucose level in blood, in blood is actually a very, very variable and very poor um, measure in the sense that it's not only very variable, but it doesn't necessarily change, detect a significant change of the, the, the condition of the individual. And we need to work out if there's an acceptable um, signal to noise ratio, a little bit more about that in a minute. And obviously the clinical actions um, following the output. And for that, what we've done are things like identifying the test performance, um, systematic reviews of diagnostic accuracy of markers, and then also secondary analysis of randomized control trials, um, courts, studies, and electronic health records. To try to explain why this is important, I'm going to use an example of a condition that we did quite a little bit of work probably about seven years ago. This is the use of warfarin on people that have high levels or ha are at high risk of having some kind of um, embolism, either pulmonary, pulmonary embolism or some kind of deep vein thrombosis or atrial fibrillation. Uh, and also people that, that have mechanical prosthetic heart valves. In those cases, the use of warfarin is recommended because it would reduce the chance of having a thrombotic complication. And the measure is commonly used in order to manage these individuals, in the case of warfarin, is something called the INR. How many of you are familiar with this? Not very many? Okay. The INR is, in a way, a number. And here I have the scale between, um, typically some, some point between zero and six. It could be higher than that, but that's, that's about right. What's particularly, particularly interesting about the INR compared to many of the other measures that we're going to be look, that I, we've looked at is that INR actually has a very specific target range. If your INR is lower than your lower limit, your risk of having a uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis or uh, venous thromboembolism increases exponentially. So you want to be above that lower limit. But if you're much higher than the maximum limit, limit your chances of having a hemorrhage actually also shoots up. So people that are taking warfarin are always trying to trade off this issue of having high risk of, of having a stroke with some bleeding. And some people that, one of the approaches of the monitoring and the management of um, warfarin has been to do it by themselves, self-monitoring. And the way sometimes people do it is just by making sure they have minor bleeds. And they will, th that way they know they are towards the top end of the threshold and they're not having a, a, a high risk, but as long as they can, they can manage to keep it that way. This slide highlights the level of variability that we can observe in a person or individual that is well controlled, that manages their condition fairly well. It's still INR. What we have are two graphs. The bottom one provides the INR levels. Uh, the thresholds or the limits for this particular individual are between 2.5 and 3.5. One of the things that, again, are very interesting for this particular condition is that the thresholds or the targets are individual-based. Depending on what condition you have, you have different thresholds. Some, for some um, trials, they've actually narrowed those thresholds even further. That's really interesting because it doesn't happen for many of the other conditions. So you have your thresholds. You have each one of the dots identifying what that particular, for that particular week, I think it's every two weeks you have the information, for that particular week, what was their INR? You have your moving average, which is the line in red. And on the graph at, on top, you have the um, dose of warfarin. And as you can see, it, it, it changes considerably. And it's in response to the INR measures and also some perceived changes that that individual happened. We know, for example, like, again, again, anecdotally, that if you take a lot of cabbage, that would substantially affect your, um, how the, um, or either your level of INR or how the warfarin interacts with your, with your body. So you might actually modify how much warfarin, <laughs> warfarin you, you're going to be taking. So again, this is, this is again showing the level of variability, how it impacts on the management of the chronic condition, and in some cases, how self-management <coughs> appears to be more useful, or more um, effective than management by uh, clinician. And this is just to highlight, it's another piece of work that we did a while, a while back, to highlight how the TTR, which is time in range, 
time in therapeutic threshold seems to have a strong association with um, um, the major events. So hemorrhage and thrombo thrombolytic events, the, they, they show this association that the, 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 the longer the percentage of time a population stays in the time in therapeutic range, the lower the number of events happens to. So again, the association between the measurement and the event. Now, third part of the framework, the impact of monitoring. And here I'm going to go into a little bit of, a bit more stats. Because um, I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting uh, development that we've, we've been working on, um, which I think more people can and should take the opportunity to do. Um, and it's mainly to try to understand based around all the different choices that you can have for the monitoring strategies, again, things like how frequent you should be measuring, uh, what are the thresholds for when you change your um, decisions, um, what impact that will have on something as simple as how many people are false positives or true positives or false negatives. And the way we deal with that is either using information from trials or modeling. So as I was saying before, defining how to set the thresholds, how many measurements and the intervals between measurements for monitoring problems. So a little bit of background. In the case of a diagnostic test, we can simply have um, the ones that, I think I put it the wrong way around for the next one. No, that's right. In a diagnostic test, we have a test that it could be either positive or negative, and then we have those that do not have a disease and those that have a disease, and basically what we want to do is maximize the number that um, are in A and D while minimizing B and C. So B and C are our errors, the ones that are the test negative and actually have the disease, those are B, and the ones that test positive and actually do not have the disease, which are C. How does that translate to in terms of the actual management? Those in A are low risk, low cost, because there's no, no treatment cost, they don't have a disease and we don't treatment. Those that are in D are high risk, but that risk is reduced by the treatment, so that's, that's positive. But B and C, we have high risk and untreated or low risk and unnecessarily treated, which means that they might be prone to having some harms. How's that, in, how's that changed to monitoring? Well, it appears in the first instance to look exactly the same. We have estimated CKD or non-estimated CKD and whether they have it or not. And what we want to do is, again, maximize A and D and minimizing B and C. So it appears to be exactly the same, but there is a difference, mainly because we have time in the equation. And what with time in the equation, what we get is that many of individuals that did not have the disease actually progress to have the disease. So they progress from not being hypertensives with age eventually moving to being hypertensives. The way of thinking about this, we might say some of the false positives are just early positives, but that will have implications. And what we have here instead of true and false um, positive, negative, we have a lead time or lag time. So how long before we detect it or whether we detect it at all. Putting into a, some kind of framework, what we have is an annual test. If the test is positive, we initiate treatment. If it's negative, there is no action, which is typically what happens to hypertension, cholesterol, and diabetes monitoring. But the problem is that those that test positive will go into treatment regardless of whether they're really positive or not. So we accumulate, eventually almost everyone in the population will have treatment, will be in treatment. And that's what we're getting nowadays. Everyone eventually will have, I'm sure we should be all the, or I should be in statins, I should be on antihypertensive, certainly on statins. Um, so they build over time. So the question is how can we distinguish the true and false positives in this sort of equation? And one really cool analogy, uh, and this is Paul Glassew, I'm not sure how many of you have 
have met him, he's, he's a really great researcher, has given, and he kickstarted the whole monitoring program here uh, in our group, is the idea of having t turtles in a road, but that, that road is a, a bit concave, so turtles start fairly slowly and then gradually they diverge slightly and then fall into the ditch. So that's more or less what's happening here. What we have is a homogeneous population over time. They go in a particular direction. So there's a progression for the whole population, but there's going to be some random drifts of individuals. Some might progress much faster or much slower. And to add to that complication, we have the noise. So we have the individuals progressing at different types of um, um, slopes. But we also have the, slope, the noise, which is within a person there's going to be variability, which is what I was showing earlier on with the INR. And because of all those issues, actually working out the way to model this thing can be a little bit challenging. We need to somehow estimate all these different factors. We need to estimate the progression at population level. We need to estimate, well, what are the ranges of different progression at individual level? And we need also some way of modeling or understanding the general noise of the measurement itself over time, not only at a particular moment, but over time. And we've, we've done a little bit of that. So this is the same analogy of the turtles, but in a less uh, uh, friendly format. So we have in the blue line, the progression of the population if we want, and assigned to that, let's say an individual with smack on in the middle of the, of the population might have a particular level of noise. Uh, which might identify in some cases as being positive, when in reality he is not or she is not, and vice versa. He might end up over time, he actually goes beyond the particular threshold, and um, in some instances, if we test at that point, we might detect someone as being negative when in reality is actually positive. How do we fit these type of models? Well, as I was saying earlier on, what we have used has been longitudinal data, measuring over a period of time, repeated measurements on the same individuals over a period of time. Uh, this could also be done by using accuracy studies and syn synthesizing the, the um, epidemiology from that, but that's a little bit more difficult and we haven't done that. Mainly ha we have been working on longitudinal data either from randomized controlled trials or lately from observational studies. And we have used, in terms of how we do that, uh, we've used um, estimation methods we can use graphical methods, but mainly use estimation methods following an analytic. Um, of late, we've, we've, um, we've expanded to other types of methods, but the, the basic one is an analytic method from the normal distribution. This P, Y, Y star will become clear in, in a second, hopefully. This horrible thing, what is it saying? Well, what we have is a series of four things that we want to estimate. One is the underlying <coughs> value at a particular a time point zero that is at baseline. That's the UI not. I is a patient or the individual. The observed, which is Y. So on the underlying and the observed at baseline. And the same underlying and observed at a given time point, time point T. Both the underlying and the observed, the actual average would be the same because the only thing that differs is that one is with noise and the other one is without noise. So the observed is with noise and the underlying or the true one is without noise. And that's why we have the mean for both the underlying and the observed being alpha i at time point zero and alpha i plus beta i t at time point two. So it's a progression. So beta is a progression. And the error is captured by your sigma t. So that's the noise in all terms. In a graph, what that allows us to do, if we can set it in that particular way, it allows us to say, OK, if we can estimate that sigma, that beta, that alpha, it will then allow us to make then um, statements around the probability of an observed value being above a threshold, given that the underlying value is below a threshold. That is the false positive. And also around the false negative, the probability of the observed value being below the threshold, given that the underlying is above a threshold. Here's an example. So let's say, and this is what we, we did, for example, in the case of cholesterol measurements, 
we collected data from, I think this was, I'm trying to think it was randomized controlled trials of observational data. Can't remember. But this is the type of um, statements that we were able to, to say. If we have a true cholesterol at baseline of 4.5 millimoles per liter, in one year, the probability of the real value for that individual being above 5 is 0 0.015. The probability of the observed being above 0.5, sorry, above 5, and the underlying being above 5 is 0 0.009. The probability of being above 5 and the underlying being below 5 is 0 0.014, which would then transforms into we can get 16-fold positive tests for every two positive. We can quantify how many more false positives we get for every two positive. What we have is that there's, there's low progression over time. There's quite a lot of noise. The noise is actually what detects someone being above the threshold rather than the actual progression. And hence, we can quantify the number of individuals that would have, in this case, that would be treated by statins, for statins, when in reality they might not be, need to be treated for statins. We can do exactly the same thing for the, uh, uh, diabetic uh, nephropathy, for example. In this case, is the cumulative uh, number of tests per women, how many of those are true positives, how many of those are false negatives, and as, again, as in any of these scenarios, because we have monitoring, what happens is the number of true positives increases over time because people are catching up. Remember the, the, the lead time bias? That as we progress, more people become um, having the condition compared to the other case. The final thing is the implementation. How am I doing this? Okay. okay. This is the last bit. Implementation monitoring. <laughs> For implementing monitoring, one thing that we've, we've done is uh, integrating all these approaches into a cost-effectiveness model, and we've done also some, some qualitative um, work in trying to understand the impact or how monitoring is being done in the community. So this is, and it might look a bit horrible, but this is a type of set up for the model, the economic model, in order to understand the impact of monitoring. We have an entry point, people come in with certain characteristics, a given value for their EGFR and other medical history. We know that they do not have, um, they, they had a non-fatal stroke, for example, MI or heart failure hospitalization. From that, they can either go to having uh, vascular death, uh, a non fatal stroke, uh, first heart failure hospitalization, non-fatal MI, or death. And that happens within a one, uh, an annual cycle, after which they start up again. And from that, we, can, we, we have, for example, estimates of how many people have a vascular death, how many people have non-vascular death, we would have estimates of, again, non-fatal stroke, non-fatal MI, and hospital failure hospitalization. We can input into that the, um, the change of the modification, the treatment given that we measure, let's say, cholesterol or, or um, um, EGFR would bring. So the treatment actually will modify the risk. And from that, we can quantify the impact that monitoring brings to, um, to this particular situation. We can then decide, and we can modify the, for example, frequency. Let's say, what happens if we monitor every year? What happens if we monitor every two years? What happens if we monitor every five years? And that will give us a comparison as to which would be a better alternative or better strategy for monitoring purposes. Qualitative studies. We did a bit of work on CKD. We were very interested in finding out what happened, uh, what, what perceptions were uh, for individuals that had CKD and also for health professionals. The, the reason for this is that we heard from health professionals that they were not particularly, um, that they thought that we, that we were being, that they were asked to be mesh, to measure C, um, EGFR too regularly without actually having much to do. So these are the number of individuals, and in a nutshell, the findings are from the patient perspective, 
is that there, there was a substantial gap between what the patients understood and what the GPs thought they had been telling them. In particular, many patients didn't know that they had CKD. And they were in the CKD register until much later. They, they didn't find out about this. That in general, the primary care professionals avoided the term CKD, certainly in the early stages, to avoid anxiety. And from the patient's accounts, we heard that the terms being used, like kidney damage or kidney failure, were very frightening. That the term chronic kidney disease was, in some cases, misinterpreted as meaning serious, a very serious condition. And so I've been showing what happens, certainly in the early stages, that people just live with that for, without any, any issues. That understanding the results uh, was actually generally very difficult. And just like in the case of heart, um, uh, blood pressure, high blood pressure, because there's no symptoms associated with it, it was actually very difficult to understand and manage it. They considered that this describing, um, instead of chronic kidney disease as a decreasing kidney function, would probably be as a percentage, for example, or in, uh, instead of a stage, might be less alarming. From the perspective of the health professionals, GPs were not familiar with latest NICE guidance. Instead, they got their information from CCGs and uh, quaff alerts, which was interesting. They found the NICE website confusing. And they had questions like, for example, what should I do if the albumin creatinine abrations? Um, how, how should, when should I request it? At what levels of CKD should I request? And how should I interpret these, these values? So that, again, feeds into understanding how the test itself might be used or when might not, it might not be used. So I hope this gives you a bit of a, an idea of the framework that we use and how we feed information into that framework, how it fits together, the type of models that we use. It's actually something that we, we've done in a large program of work looking at not only CKD but also chronic heart failure as well. This um, gives you a, less, a, a little um, uh, format of how it all fits together. So we evaluate the current practice, current evidence, new quantitative and qualitative evidence, and finally fit it all either in economic model or discussing the economic issues, supported by a stakeholder group, and we produce recommendations and implications for the future. Hopefully this will appear in an NIHR report next year. It's been submitted. It's on now in the um, peer review stage, so that's why I hope. Sometimes it takes forever. <laughs> um, and obviously many, many thanks to loads, loads and loads of people that have been working on this area for a long period of time. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you very much for a very sort of uh, bright and favorite talk on how we do this uh, not podcast, which is a podcast for uh, Python. Um, I'm just curious about your initial few slides where you showed the sort of status of the monitoring. <coughs> and I'm thinking about an example, let's say, blood pressure. Um, can you capture that sort of scenario within the electronic blood pressure? With, with blood pressure, we have good idea of, about the, I think now the variability of the measurements themselves, even depending on which, who takes the, 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 the measurement, if it's a clinician or if it's the individual. We have, I think we have good estimates of variability. So from that, we would be able to um, work out uh, also how often you need to be measuring um, I think blood pressure might not be an ideal, simply because we have, in a way, we have quite a lot of um, information there. We have a very rigorous standard as to the type of measure and how the measurements will be taken. Um, having said that, I think there's still some questions whether the actual measurement that people have is the adequate and whether you use al alternative, for example, long, long period of measurements themselves. Um, whether CPRD will give you, for that particular example, I think, I think you already have um, information from other sources rather than CPRD. CPRD will tell you, for example, what happens after 
treatment. That might, might be useful in the real case scenario. Um, and that might be useful in terms of whether, for example, the treatment itself changes the variability or not. That, that, that would be a situation where I, I, would, I would use that source of information. May? Yeah. How accurate? Because when it comes to this maintenance stage, there will be more monitoring done by the patient. Yeah. yeah. And so, how accurate is that? I mean, sometimes the reports will get good, or even if they do, it will be very sharp. Is there a way to measure the, the accuracy of the patient self-monitoring, or we just somehow <coughs> Yeah, so, so what you're saying is, uh, can we design or can we identify ways of defining if the measurements from individuals is actually as useful as measurements from clinicians? Yeah, yeah. So the INR, in the INR example, there, was, there has been quite a few randomized controlled trials that have specifically compared self-monitoring versus clinician monitoring. Um, and surprise, well not surprisingly, interestingly, they have shown that self-monitoring is actually more effective in terms of managing or reducing the, um, the main outcomes of both hemorrhage and uh, stroke. The argument for that is that people learn quite quickly what works for them and because there's a very, a very well set threshold for the INR, they can regulate other aspects in their life, as I was saying, for example, diet or exercise in order to keep to that threshold compared to what would happen from, for clinicians. So they would have to wait much longer in order to get to the clinician and, and then find out if the INR is in range, by which point there's no educational component, if you want, of how other aspects of the lifestyle affect their INR. But on the other side, for diabetes, type 2 diabetes, there's been, again, quite a few studies being carried, randomized controlled trials of self-monitoring blood glucose compared to clinician monitoring. And in those cases, although there's been a reduction uh, or an improvement in the control, is so small that it's deemed to be non-clinically relevant. So it's the opposite. Well, not the opposite. It is, it is different. It's the opposite in the sense that further studies, at least in one particular randomized controlled trial, further, quali further qualitative studies found that the people that were doing the self-management had higher levels of anxiety and worry compared to those in the, in the clinical, in, in being managed by the clinician. So it depends, it depends in the scenario. Um, for some cases, self-monitoring appears to be particularly useful. We think for blood pressure, so the work that Richard McMahon has been doing, uh, self-monitoring of blood pressure appears to be quite useful. Um, but for others, it, it doesn't. It, it, it is for the, for the cost effective in this point of view. Obviously, patients monitor themselves. That would dramatically reduce the cost of the healthcare. Possibly. Depends how, many, depends how many tests, depends who pays for the tests. Depends on, on, on what happens uh, in terms of management. So if there is a change in the medication, would the patient do the change in medication or would they have to go back to the clinician in order to actually change the treatment? In which case you're already bringing in the clinician's time. So th th there, are, there are many elements to that. So it's not always, it's not always a case. Any, any other questions? Yeah. A bit down the line. And then you transform that into, you know, dichotomize it into false positive, as a, as a threshold of decision making, and then you calculate those false and positive benefits and so on. Yep. Yeah. 
Yep. How have you got a solution for that? And sometimes in the other way, it's the case that you know, it might be sort of a continuous dialogue, but the decision is not at the end binary. I mean, yeah. is, is that what you spoke to? So, so there's, do you, have you met Jason Oak? He's, he's a statistician working with us. He did his PhD on different approaches to estimating monitoring or monitoring questions, particularly when you don't have a continuous. And one thing that came up was a, st a state um, um, model approach. So this is what he's done for CKD. We, he tried modeling EGFR using a continuous measure and it just didn't work very well. So instead he modeled it using the different CKD stages, normal function, model reduction, et cetera, et cetera. And based on that, he can work on, he can identify transition rates. So going from, let's say, normal function, which is your EGFR or what we CKD zero, uh, moving from that to mild and moderate reduction in a year, there'll be 1.1% of people that move there in reality. While misclassified by EGFR, we are around 3%. That value there. <coughs> so there are, there, are, there are potential approaches that we can use where we don't have, either when we don't have a continuous measure or when the <coughs> continuous measure doesn't work appropriately. The, um, regarding when the decision making is not binary, uh, I'm trying to think if we have done anything. That will impact obviously on the model itself, making this type of model much more complex, I think. Um, I think I think so far the only thing that we've done is um, changes in medication. But I mean potentially you can yeah. you can make so it more complex. Yeah, you can make it. You so can make it. More. The more sort of a general question. I mean, at the beginning, you just uh, provided the citation that it says that RCTs are not the, the right thing for, for testing. Can you expand on that? I don't quite get it. Why not? So, in the case of diagnostic tests, the the issue is sometimes down to efficiency, because you will only. You're only going to be modifying things for these groups. So if, if it happens that those in disease progression are a very small number, you're going to have to randomize huge amounts for the majority not to have anything. So that's why the argument in the case of diagnostic test is well, at least we, we need, first of all, to know if the test itself is going to be useful. Work out on diagnostic accuracy. Once you work out diagnostic accuracy, maybe some models. And then once we say, yes, this is very likely to use, then go to a randomized control trial. It's not necessarily saying never do randomized control trials, but sometimes it's too early. And my argument is that just like in the case of diagnostic tests, the monitoring is even more difficult because not only, not only the issue about how many, but also about whether the, whether the threshold is right, the frequency is right, etc. So I get the point about efficiency, but I thought there was something in the title of that paper about bias. Um, invalid. So sometimes invalid. Is I need to check. I need to check Patrick. Yeah. He, he, he's very <laughs> he's very he's very good. Uh, he, he'll be someone to to bring to one of those seminars. He's yeah. he's a he's an excellent speaker. Thank you. Right. Thank you, guys. It's a hugely important topic. I mean, I just, I mean, for, for some of you are not sort of clinically active. It is one of the greatest areas in medicine. We really don't know when to monitor and who to follow up and how. And this is the, the biggest source of di diability in healthcare and I would argue the biggest source of waste and uh, cost consumption. I mean, it's going to become ever worse. I mean, the, the push for, you know, saying self-diagnostic tools, portable things, data being more easily accessible and so on, as the unit price of monitoring 
Thank you very much.